Greetings with Clovers everywhere and welcome to E-Train Talks. I'm a 12-year-old literacy advocate, podcast host, Giving Tuesday Spark Leader and book lover. And I just forgot to say my name. My name is E-Train. Today's interview is an incredibly exciting and special one. I have the honor of talking with three-time Newberry honoree, literacy hero, and an incredible human being. She's the voice behind over 20 middle grade stories that include and celebrate diversity and inclusivity in everything from gorgeous picture books to heartfelt middle grade novels to even an amazing graphic no- graphic novel. The pointing is hard because it's weird on Zoom. Um, <laughs> so I'm talking about the wonderful author, Christina Suntornbot. And as we will find out in our talk, Christina may be an award-winning writing extraordinaire now, but she didn't start out writing books. She began her adult life studying and working in the science field. That is not something we hear every day when talking to authors, especially. And so it's always so much fun, a great talking point when authors have unique backstories. And I'm excited to help discover and share more about my incredible guest. So without further ado, let's all welcome Christina to E-Train Talks. (gasps) Thank you so much. Oh my goodness, what an introduction. Thank you, E-Train. Yeah. I I would like for you to introduce me everywhere I go, please. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I've been so excited for this interview ever since we had it scheduled, and I just love all of these books that I have right here of yours, and I'm sure I'm definitely going to get some more after this interview. Thank you. That means so, so much to me. my first question for you is, as a member of the AAPI writing community, you write beautiful, diverse stories that include authentic characters. But my question is, how do you feel about writers who aren't necessarily members of the AAPI community? or really any who aren't a part of any of the community that are writing about characters that they may not necessarily share the same experiences with. Right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This is such a great question, you know, and it's a huge question that writers are asking and talking about amongst themselves, not just people who write for children, but like all writers are asking what story should I tell? Can I tell this one? Can I tell that one? Right. And so, you know, I, all the characters in my books are almost always kids that are like me. Mm-hmm. I mean, especially the tryout is like my memoir. It's my story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I write like that because um, I think that I, I didn't grow up with stories. You know, I didn't grow up with books with Asian American characters. And I just feel this enormous like outpouring of creative energy to want to tell those stories because that's what's important to me. I do think that writers can write well about people who are not like them, but I think it's really hard. I think that you have to do a ton of research. You have to have so much knowledge, so much empathy that like for me, if I was going to write a story about like a kid who grew up in Louisiana in New Orleans or something like that and they you know were impacted by Hurricane Katrina I really don't think I could write that like it would just take so much work Mm -hmm. so I I feel like the writers who have done that work can do it well so um you know it's a tricky question and I've read a lot of books that um haven't done it well And so I think whenever I see a writer writing about Asian American Pacific Islander characters, and if they're not, they're not Asian American themselves, I'm always a little bit nervous because I don't know how it's going to go. But um, I think it's a question we're going to keep talking about and we're Mm going to keep going through because we can't, writers, we can't always write about people who are exactly 100% Mm -hmm. like us. We're never going to be doing that all the time. So my short, long answer is, I don't know. We're still working on it. (laughs) Yeah. And it's it's really tough because you want authentic characters, but you also want those characters to be represented more in middle grade. So it's kind of a tough balance. Yeah, it totally is. And there's also a lot of, you know, I think, like I said, authors have responsibility to to do their research Mm -hmm. and try to come from the best place possible. But then I also think, you know, publishers have a responsibility too. there's so much that's involved in getting a book out there. It's not just writing it. It's 
what gets what gets acquired and how books get marketed you know what gets what gets put in the very front of the bookstore when you walk in right and so we they have a responsibility too to to do support authentic stories definitely and my next question for you is kind of diving into one of your books so one of your most profound works of nonfiction is all 13 which shares a story of the wild boars no not the animals there's 12 kids, 12 members of a soccer team, and 12 kids who were tragically trapped in a flooded cave in Thailand for over a month. In all 13, you dive deep into each of the kids' tales. So how did you go about researching the book? Did you interview primary sources, or was it based on information through research alone? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, talk about like wanting to tell an authentic story. This, I had no plans to write all 13. I... I had never written nonfiction before, mm -hmm. but my family is Thai. My dad's family is, you know, almost entirely lives in Thailand. And we were actually in Thailand when the rescue was taking place. Oh, yes. Yeah, we were just there on vacation and we were just like watching it on on television, just unfolding this incredible rescue. So I just felt really strongly like, oh, I've got to There's so much that mm -hmm. I want to talk about here about Thai people and culture and what this means and why this is important. And um, and so really dove into it without knowing what I was doing. And I knew I would have to go to Thailand and interview people because there's so much um, especially when at the time when I was writing the book, there was so much about the story that was not in the news that was not, yeah. you know, not covered. So if I was going to figure it out, I couldn't just like read about it online or like pick up a book and read about it. So I knew I had to go there and interview people. So I did that. I hopped on a plane and my dad met me in that area in far northern Thailand because I don't speak fluent Thai and my dad oh, does. Yeah. So he was my translator. And we... I, when I landed, I had one interview set up and I, that was it. I, I was like, I don't even know who is going to talk to me. I don't know. And, but I was so lucky that the place where the rescue happened was a small town. And so oh. everyone knew everybody else. And so interviewing one person, he was like, you got to meet my friend because he was involved in the rescue too. So he would take me to go meet his friend and I would interview that person. And then they would inter introduce me to this person. They Somebody knew the divers, so I got to talk to the divers. And then just through all of this, eventually got to talk to the boys also oh, yeah. and to the coach. Yeah. So it was really just this incredible experience of diving in and just going for it and just relying on the kindness of people to set me up so that I could talk to everybody that I did. It, it was, it was, I have never had an experience like that. I don't think I ever will again. It's amazing. Well, it's really hard to write compelling stories that are nonfiction. And I feel like you did a really good job of that. And I mean, a lot of kids are hesitant to read nonfiction because there's not a lot of the times a story there to that kind of sink deep into because books are meant to be an escape. But you did a great job of having truth, but also kind of making it a story that all readers would want to read. Ah, oh, thank you so much. I mean, I feel like that's because of all the people I talked to that mm -hmm. they their stories was impacting me so much. Like I felt like, okay, I that's how I'm going to tell it. I'm going to tell it about these people. And like, so you really connect to the nonfiction through these human beings. So. Absolutely. <laughs> so my next question is about your graphic memoir, The Tryout. It was your first graphic memoir. Well, I mean, it's a graphic memoir. So like there's not too many graphic memoirs that you would be able to write about yourself. Um, so it's your first gra graphic memoir in the middle grade space. I don't know why I'm saying that. You might write another graphic memoir in the middle grade space in the future. I don't know. Yeah, uh, no, first and first graphic novel, first memoir, first, yeah. a, first a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. The Tryout is certainly a book of first, not just in your writing world, but also in your world as a teenager. So what emotions went through your head whilst writing the book? Because the book features a bit of the bullying that you experienced and it can be really hard to tell your truth. Like I've experienced a lot of bullying at school and it's just hard to tell my mom, but you were able to channel what you experienced into a beautiful book. And so, 
how did you find the strength to write your truth and the true truth, I guess? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Such a great question. I totally feel you about like, it's hard to tell your mom. I, well, I never told my mom about what was happening to me in middle school. Um, part of that was that at that time, you know, I was in middle school like 30 years ago. <laughs> so <laughs> at that time, there was just this sort of attitude around bullying of like, oh, that's just part of growing up. Kids will be yeah. kids. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, it makes you tough, you know, toughen up. And, and especially because a lot of the bullying that I went through was about race and mm -hmm. racism. And there was, I think just people didn't want to talk about that, that, you right. know, people wanted to be like, it doesn't exist. We're past all that. Yeah. And, um, so I, you know, I, I think of a huge part of being able to tell the truth was that I, I didn't start trying until I was 40. So there's all this space, you know, that I had to yeah. think about it and process it. And I, I think it is hard when it's happening to you in the moment. Like, I, I don't think I could have possibly written about it in that moment. Um, but actually the thing that I had to do, um, I had to really accept that things that, that grownups might have said like, that's no big deal. Um, I had to remember what it was like to be your age or to be Christina's age in the book. And that, no, it was a huge deal. It was like yeah. everything. It's like my whole world was this one, you know, moment, this one class where this boy would pick on me or something like mm -hmm. that was, you know, it was all consuming for me at that time. So just to step back there and to remember what it was like. And it helps that um, I have two daughters that are around middle school age now. Yeah. So that so I'm seeing them go through all of these things and and just, you know, how impactful one thing that someone says to them can be for them. So that I, I think all of that really helped, but not easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's really interesting to think about because you were in middle school such a long time ago. I don't want to make you feel old. That probably made you feel old. Um, no, it's okay. <laughs> like my mom always tells me, write everything that's going on in like a Google Doc or something, but it can be really hard. And it's because it feels like your entire world, no matter what anybody else says, like it's just middle school that's going to end like in, when you get to high school. But like I'm in middle school right now and I'm not in high school right now. It's just everything. It, it takes over your head, kind of. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I, I totally I, I totally agree with you. And your mom is so smart and so yeah. wise. <laughs> she didn't tell me to say that. <laughs> but like, um, yeah, I think writing it down, if you're if you're only writing it for you, that that can help. I, I think I wish I would have done that. I wish I would have kept a journal just mm -hmm. to like get all that stuff out for True. one thing. Yeah. But also E-Train, one day you might want to write about your experiences and you were going to wish you had a journal to go back <laughs> and read. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll get a journal after this interview. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, not like you, you have a lot of extra time, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like something to keep on my bucket list. Yeah, exactly. So kind of shifting away from your book, so we'll definitely get back to that. I'm surprised, I was really surprised to discover that your background is actually in the sciences. So you have a bachelor of science degree in mechanical engineering and a master's in science education. So I even read that you even spent a decade working in a science museum. Now that must've been a lot of fun. So oh can you share a bit about your life as a scientist not necessarily a scientist, rather somebody who was in the field of sciences, though I guess you could call that a scientist, as well as what prompted you to turn your focus from a science field to pursuing a career in writing? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the reason I sort of started off wanting to be in the sciences is because even though I loved reading, I was, I mean, I'm looking at your bookshelf and I'm like, I, there's some books that I would have had. And like my room would have been like that, you know? <laughs> um, and I loved writing stories and coming up with stories. And I was always like making up plays and things like that, but I had no, I never met an author. Mm -hmm. I never, you know, there was nothing that would have shown me that it was a job you could have. It was yeah. like, totally opaque you might have said I, it, it seemed more 
I, I had more of an idea of what you needed to do to be an astronaut than to be an author, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so yeah. like, I just, I didn't even think about it as a job. And I always liked science. I've always liked, you know, reading lots of different things and learning different things. So it just sort of seemed like a fit. And then after I got out of college, I was working at like an engineering firm, like doing actual real science work. And, and I was like, I, I don't really like this so much. <laughs> um, so I got a job in a science museum because I've always loved kids being around kids and working with them in some way. So it felt like, okay, I can, I can work with kids and I can kind of tell stories about science. That was really what my job was, was like, we would build these exhibits. So we would take some scientific topic like nanotechnology and tell a story about it so that yeah. you could learn about it with your family. And it was so fun. It was like the most fun job. Um, but it was while I was working at that museum, I had a meeting with um, a chemistry professor mm -hmm. and he walked in and we were gonna talk about like doing a chemistry exhibit. And he brought a book with him in his stack of papers. And it was like a, um, a paperback copy. And it, it was a book called Zach Proton, the, the Adventures of Zach Proton. And the guy's name was on the book and he had, oh. he had written that book. And I just kept staring at it. And I was like, did you write that book? And he, he told me like, yeah, I'm, I'm a chemistry professor and I also write children's books. And my mind just like exploded. <laughs> And so he kind of got me like going, um, he, he told me about this group in Austin, Texas, where I live, where everybody meets and you share stories and you try to help each other get published. And I started going to that group and I just, all of this like many years of wanting to tell stories and not really knowing how to do it, that was all it took to get me to be, you know, be able to try to get published. And it took years and years, it took a long time, but that was like the spark of it was meeting someone. Yeah, that's an awesome story. And I kind of, before I started actually talking to authors, it just seems like um, authors who write stories, they're just so distant. They're like behind a computer. They don't, they're not real. They're like AI. But then when you get to meet them and like understand that they are people with personalities and stories to tell, it can really like inspire you and yeah, give you a spark, like you said. Yeah. I mean, that's why this, what you do here is so important because you're like, you're this gateway to other yeah. people seeing authors and that they're, they're real ordinary people, like so ordinary, so <laughs> boring, <laughs> like anybody yeah, like can you. do it. <laughs> and yeah, like understanding that people are ordinary, like can kind of bring them bring them down to earth and be like, they're people too. Exactly. I can do that. Exactly. Yes, totally. So for all the teachers and librarians who are listening to this or watching, or who are hoping to find some way to add your excellent stories to their school curriculum, do you have any teaching questions or guides or kits for educators to use for their students? Yeah, I do. On my website, uh, soontornvot.com, usually like at um, many of the books I have, the publisher works with a teacher or works with like a re retired librarian oh. to come up with like teaching guides um, and yeah, book club questions, things like that. And that's, I'm always so grateful for that because I remember when I was in school, like reading out loud, reading, read aloud time was my number one favorite thing and like novel study always I loved that more than anything else so the thought that educators are doing that in their classroom with my books is just uh, like I really can't believe it <laughs> yeah and I've seen pictures on social media of a lot of book clubs reading your new graphic novel series and yeah. would you mind telling us about that oh yeah about the series um yeah. Legends of Lotus Island yep yeah okay so here let me see if I'm no, I, it's kind of on the spot, so you're gonna. I got it. <laughs> yeah, this is um a fantasy series, and it's uh it's it's actually illustrated, so it's not graphic Ooh. novel. It's but it's there's illustrations every like twelve pages or something like that, and it's illustrated by Kevin Hong, and it's about kids who train to transform into fantastical creatures that protect the natural world. So there's definitely like an environmental theme there. And um, the legends of Lotus Island, the main character, her name is Plum. And so she travels 
uh, from her little island where she lives. The whole series takes place on in this island world. Like everyone lives on little different islands. Mm -hmm. And she travels to Lotus Island to mm -hmm. try to go to this academy where she's trying to learn how to do this. And in the first book, she's having a lot of trouble. So she has to meet new friends. She makes some enemies and she's all like, try, you know, trying to figure out exactly who yeah. she is, and where she fits. So there's gonna be four books. There's two that are out now. And I'm, I just turned in the fourth book and I'm just waiting because every time I turn in a book, my editor, you know, she'll come back with this yeah. letter of all the things I have to fix and like <laughs> the ways to make it better. So I'm just, I should be getting that any moment. <laughs> you were just waiting and then all the editing has to start. That's right. I know yeah. I can't, some, in some ways I kind of dread it because I'm like, oh, I know there's going to be a lot of work, but yeah. in some ways I'm like excited because mm -hmm. the editor, like they really do help you so much. Like having somebody else read it and tell you how to make it better is such, that's so great. Yeah. Like rather than just, you have to figure it out by yourself. And you also mentioned the, the cover of the, all the covers are just so, so like, I mean, words can't describe how good they are. I saw the cover reveal of the third book on your Twitter. It's just yes. like, yes, the wow. The cover is, the, our artist is amazing. This is the second book. Yeah. So um, Kevin just, oh my gosh. I don't know how I got so lucky to get to work with him. He really like um, goes all out and he, you know, I don't send him any notes for like what something should look like. Like I didn't tell him like, oh, Plum needs to look like this with these clothes and there's this yeah. tree. It looks exactly like this. I just write the story and he comes up with all of that. It's amazing. It's like magic, really. Yeah, like it's like writing and art are both like magic and they're kind of intertwining into beautiful stories. Yeah, it's it's I'm so grateful for the artists I get to work with. And the tryout is getting a sequel. Oh, and I can show you. Um, so our, talk about also an incredible artist. Uh, our artist, Joanna, is oh, she's wow. working on the inks, the black and white drawings for the second book. It's called The Squad, and it's coming out next year. And so this is also what I'm doing. As I'm waiting for the notes on Legends of Lotus Island, I'm going through her sketches and making little notes for her for the final art. So that's exciting times. Yeah. And do you find that writing for graphic novels is tougher than writing for maybe middle grade novels that like prose? Yeah, I, it's definitely it's so different. I really had to like study it and learn how to do it. It's much more like writing a script for a movie. Yeah. Uh, not that I've ever done that, but that's what I that's what I studied to to yeah. try to learn how to do this because you every panel in the book is sort of like a scene. So you kind of have to tell the artist what's going on here and you write the dialogue and then the artist like lays it out as if they're the director shooting the movie. Um, and yeah, it's just it's really, really different. And I also think that um, writing a memoir, you know, it was it was hard to learn how to write a yeah. memoir. Um, you it's really it's a very strange thing when you can't just make up what happens. Like you really have to yeah. tap into the things that happen to you to write the story. So it's just, it, it's challenging, but I kind of like that. Yeah. That's, that's sort of why I write so many different things is I really like to feel like I'm kind of on my toes and I'm not just like, oh, I know how to do this. This is easy. Yeah. That's boring, you know? Mm -hmm. And I like, you can, I once tried to write a little bit about what's going on in my life and it just kind of feels a little like there's this um, little part of my brain in the back of my head. It's like, you're so narcissistic, you train writing about yourself. I mean, it is kind of, it is, yeah. but, um, but it's important. I mean, yeah, it is important. And you have to, that's one of those voices you have to shut off. Yeah. And, and the way that I shut it off is that I thought anytime I started to feel like that, I was like, well, maybe someone else who's reading this book, they felt the same way. And if I tell my story, they're going to know they're not alone. Right. So that's, you know, that's a way to get it. To tell that, that voice to <laughs> shush. Yeah. Be quiet. <laughs> that's right. I have to do that with, there's a lot of voices in my head that I have to tell the shush. <laughs> You're yeah. kind of a little bit 
crazy when you're an author. You have a lot of voices in your head. <laughs> I mean, I think we're all a little crazy sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so moving back to your books, The Last Map Maker, which is up here, it actually won the Newbery Honor in 2023. I do. I got the book before it won the Newbery Honor, so I don't have the um, like amazing patch on it. But uh, I could send you one. Oh, that would be <laughs> okay. Yeah, that that's one cool thing is when you get that, they send you like a little packet of stickers. Oh, cool. So I can send you one. You can put it on there. You yeah. can feel like the committee, like you're the. Committee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the last map maker is about a young pretty mischievous girl who's also the assistant to one of the most renowned map makers in the world. So she herself is full of secrets, but on her new expedition, she isn't the only person who has these hidden truths inside of her. So I feel like a lot of your books, for instance, we have right here, A Wish in the Dark. You can't really see it because the tryout's kind of blocking it. Um, But there's secrets involved in that which we'll talk a little bit more la about later but also in the last map maker everybody has secrets do you think that it really it, is it harder to add secrets to many characters points of views i guess not just your protagonist because there's all these little hints and details that you have to add to make every story like authentic is that any like more difficult for you than writing say a graphic memoir about yourself yeah, um, you know what? I I took this writing class one time from the author Donna Gephardt. Um, oh, she's yeah. this incredible middle grade author uh, who is also the nicest person in the world. And in that class, her advice was: when you're coming up with a character, um, think about this. You know, you, you think about okay, what do they want? What are their goals? What's their their history? You know, you're trying to build out this real person. And she said think about what are they hiding from the world? Because we're all hiding something. We all, you know, none of us is a complete open book. And what are they hiding from themselves also? Like, what do they not want to admit to themselves? And I think we all have something about that, like that, that we're carrying around. And that just really, like every time I write a book, I think about that. And I think, you know, some people's secrets are, bigger and heavier and, and, you know, weigh them down more than other people. Um, but when I was writing The Last Map Maker, I knew that this thought of like secrets and everyone is like not exactly who they say was going to be a big theme in the book yeah. because I knew they were going to be on a ship. And mm -hmm. I was just like, that is just like a pressure cooker. You know, like you're trapped on this yeah. ship. It's like Survivor. You know, you're <laughs> on this island with people. You can't, nobody can get off. No, no, no. It's you're, you're in this really intense situation. And then if everyone is keeping a secret from everybody else, um, oh, that's going to be like such great drama. Mm -hmm. And, and this character, Sai, the girl is going to have to navigate all of this and, and figure out how is she going to let her own secrets out too. Right. So it just felt like that was going to be a huge part of the book. And that with that part was fun. It was fun yeah. to write. Many characters all on one boat. They <laughs> all have something to hide. Tune in to MTV, the last map maker reality TV show. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love it. <laughs> call my, call my film agent. Yeah. Let's make it <laughs> yeah. Let's make it happen. So I guess a follow-up question to this could be, are you an avid map user because you had to write, you know, the last map maker, or do you use GPS when you go everywhere? Oh my gosh, I just use GPS now, and I'm, and it's so funny <laughs> because, like, I I was talking with my friend the other day about when we were in high school, nobody had phones. I, I mean, they right. were like a giant brick, you know, <laughs> phones. And we, I lived in a kind of a small town. And so everybody lived like out in the country and all these places. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to my friend, I was like, how did we know where to go? How did we, <laughs> did, you, did you ever use a map? She was like, I don't think so. I think we were just lost a lot of the time. <laughs> so, cause now with GPS, like I don't, I just plug it in and I just yeah. follow what it says. But yeah, I, I, I love maps when I was a kid. I loved looking at them and like, I would, you know, we had a globe in my house, oh, yeah. just like a cheap globe, and I would just look at it. And I think there's something about a map, about a globe, that it just makes you want to come up with stories. It's just like sparks so many ideas in your mind and all the names. Um, right. So, 
that that is a big part of why I wrote the book was because it's just something that was cool that I was into yeah. when I was young. Yeah. We, I remember um, my dad and I, we used to play like the globe game where we spun a, we spun the globe and we had our finger, like the globe was just spinning. And then whatever country we'd land on, we would like uh, tell a story. That would be pretty cool to start doing again, for, but for writing, like seriously, I guess. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I, I have done that too. Yeah. And I would always be like, and stop. And it'd be like yeah. in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. I got to spin again now. Yeah. <laughs> So my next question for you is about book banning. So I know that a lot you're very vocal about your opinion on book banning. And it's a really big topic right now. It's incredibly sad how big of a topic it is. There's just mass book banning everywhere across the United States. There's like neo-Nazi organizations, like there's Moms for Liberty. I also saw this article the other day, like 11 people are responsible for 60% of book challenges in the United States. Yes. Have any of your own diverse stories have been challenged or banned? And what's kind of your stance on it? Yeah, um, I I don't know if any of my books have been outright banned. I do know that they've been, um, you know, like I have been disinvited from going to a school right. uh, mm-hmm. to talk to a school because of like the things that I write about and my um, just actually it was about like where I live because I live in a very liberal place. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I I mean, it's so terrible. It's it's affecting authors everywhere it's most of all i just hate that it's affecting kids and that Mm -hmm. you know in texas where i live there's a school district not far from me that the book banners are so vocal and just putting so much pressure on them that they decided not to buy any books this year for their they just wanted to avoid the trouble and so their kids in their district aren't getting any new books so no new dog man, no new Christina Sundorn bought books. Yeah. No, I mean, there's, if anything new comes out, they can't have it. And it's just, it's so terrible. And I think at the, at the root of it is that people in power are, they're trying to exert more power. And I think it's really telling that the way that they're doing it, you know, they're pouring so much resources, so much time. Like you said, 11 people responsible for 60% of the book bans. How much time must they spend? I mean, they must treat it like a full-time job trying to ban books, right? Mm -hmm. And it's because they know how powerful books are and how powerful young people are. And, and that is the, the lever they're trying to pull to control and to stay in power themselves. And so I think it just shows us that like we have to continue to make sure that books get into the hands of kids, that kids, all kids get to see themselves in books and know their true worth because it has to be powerful or else people wouldn't be trying to stop it. Absolutely. It's just so devastating and it hurts my heart. Like the kids, they can't see themselves in the books that they read just because I, I feel like it's it's out of power, but also like fear, because yeah. I feel like kids have power. And while adults try to disregard it, I feel like they're a bit afraid. So it just hurts me that kids can't discover like that there are people like them out there, that people have shared similar experiences. And it's just it like it makes me so mad and I want to channel all that anger to putting an end to book banning. Yeah, I I totally hear you. And you're doing so much and you've been so um such a great spokesperson for the freedom to read and that's that's so important. I mean, yeah. really books can save lives like you, mm-hmm. you know, if you read about if you read a book of somebody that's like you and you felt so alone, not feeling alone is it can really change the course of a person's life. So yeah, we got to keep doing it. (laughs) Yeah. And I saw like a lot of like people who just, their books have nothing to do with diversity. Just their last name was gay. Like, and then their books are being banned. They did like people just search up specific terms. And if their the author's name says it doesn't even matter if it's the book title, the books are just challenged and banned and taken out of schools. 
Yes. It, I mean, it says a lot about their side, right? Of like mm -hmm. what they're looking for and that they claim to be protecting children. Well, really right. that's not, that's not what's going on. And yeah. And I saw the Moms for Liberty Discord server was leaked and it's just, I mean, it's a, so sad. Like everything that they say, I couldn't even continue reading it after a while. It's just like disheartening how like humans can just be so intent on taking away kids freedom to read all people's freedom to read yeah it, it really it is so disheartening and I think you're right to like stop reading because it just can get so intense mm -hmm. and I have to remind myself all over and over again almost daily <laughs> that it's they're really in the minority they really right. don't represent most people you know most for sure they don't represent kids even though they say that they are trying that's they, it's what they use as their reasoning because kids are you talk to kids and they're like yeah it's fine i mean if if i don't if i don't want to read a book i just won't pick it up yeah you know and you know i mean kids are so open they're so empathetic and they really believe that diverse books should be out there and most most adults feel that way too it's just a very vocal minority that's Absolutely. using using their influence to do bad things so we we have to like rally our majority and every time right. that happens we we usually tend to win which is encouraging to me yeah it's really encouraging and i hope that we'll continue to win all these fights and my next question for you is about a wish in the dark. I'll just move the try out so you can all oh, see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I watched your book trailer of a wish in the dark and one quote that really stood out to me. Well, I mean, I read the book as well, but like mm -hmm. one thing that really stuck out to me was a quote that said a magical city where people suffer in the shadows. Mm -hmm. That's just so profound. And what, is really sad about that is that it's also true in today's world not a fantastical world like in grand cities there are always people that are suffering and they're not they're, some their stories aren't really brought to light so i guess my question for you is how do you balance the magic and fantasy of a wish in the dark with the sorrow and pain that many of the characters feel oh my goodness that's such a great question i mean really one thing that I love about fantasy so much is that you really cannot write about another world. You can't create a magical world without in some way commenting um, or criticizing or questioning something in our world. It's right. just every fantasy does that because you're you're building a whole new world so you're you're thinking about what's going on in ours so that's what i mean i was doing that very much um and the the a wish in the dark it's actually a twist on another novel oh, yeah. Um, yeah it's called les miserables well, that sounds like a good book yeah it's a great book and they and it's a musical they made it into a musical, oh, cool. Les Mis, which is, I don't know if you like musicals, but. I love musicals, yeah. Oh my God, you, okay, you have to listen to the music for Les Mis. It's like my favorite musical ever. It's so beautiful. And, um, but that French novel, uh, it takes, it takes place in France. It takes place in Paris. And the themes there are about, like the city is in a revolution. It's in, it's about to undergo a revolution. And the, and the people who have been oppressed are, are rising up to to say yeah. that they can't take it anymore. And so that's that really is like what, you know, sparked me to want to include that in a wish in the dark, but also because yes, it's it's going on today. We see it today, yeah. absolutely. Um it's a an issue for sure in Thailand. Um there's just so much inequality there and that's where, you know, the story kind of takes place. So mm -hmm. it felt impossible to tell the story without go, going there and making a comment on that. Yeah. Wasn't Les Mis by like Victor Hugo or yeah. something? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And he wrote also Hunchback of Notre Dame oh, yeah. is, is another famous novel of his. Um, and it was my favorite book in high school. So I wish I had a copy of it. It's 1600 pages long. So it's like about that thick. <laughs> How do you write that much in one book? Like keep the story going. 
Well, there's definitely like, there's about 300 pages that you can skip. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like it's, you know, it was 200 years ago. It's not like today where you have to worry about, oh, are people going to get distracted or something? No yeah. one had anything to do but read books. Right. <laughs> but it was, it's incredible. It's an amazing, amazing novel. And so that's, you know, doing A Wish in the Dark, I just really wanted to recreate part of what I was feeling when I read that book. Yeah. Well, A Wish in the Dark certainly had a ton of emotion that I, it was just so good. And all of your books are. And kind of, you mentioned Bangkok, which is Thailand's capital and largest city. So I read on your website that you make regular trips to visit family there. And I also ha did a search online and I found out that Bangkok has many, many bookstores, including children's bookstores. So I'm curious, do, do you visit the bookstores and talk to the students about your stories when you visit? And do you happen to like be able to speak and read Thai script? Um, so la the last time I went to Thailand, I did go to a school. I, I visited oh. an international school. And so I don't, I don't read in Thai. I can't read Thai, the Thai language. Um, I just never learned. And so whenever I go over there, I'm totally lost unless somebody's <laughs> showing me around. Um, but I, I did get to go to an international school. And so almost all the students at the school also speak English in okay. addition to like, they speak so many languages, like they're from all over the world. Um, but most of them are Thai. And, and so that was really special, just like getting to talk about the book and like all the little, the little tidbits in the book that are about mm -hmm. Thai culture that they really love to see and pick up on. And I remember I, I went to a kindergarten class and we read one of my books that's a counting book. It's a, it's a picture book called The Blunders. And we, we counted in English and we counted oh. in Spanish and we counted in Thai. And it was so, oh. so sweet. It was really cool. That, Never done that before. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. And now it's time, sadly, for the final question of the interview. The question I ask every person I've ever interviewed, if you could be or meet any literary character, it could be your favorite character in a book, or it could be your favorite author, who would it be and why? Oh my gosh, this is a very hard one for me. Yeah. And for when, so when I thought about this question, my first instinct and I'm so I'm you know I, I love so many books so many authors yeah. but my very first the thing that popped up in my mind was Despero oh, <laughs> from, yeah. from Kate DiCamillo's book Despero <laughs> yeah I don't know why that I don't think that I'm really like him but I think <laughs> you know He's like iconic Maybe. Yes, just iconic. And I think maybe in that moment that I was thinking about this question, I felt like maybe I needed to be brave about something. And so, um, yeah, I just think about the impact that this one, he, he's my favorite type of character, which is a small character, mm -hmm. uh, someone small and seemingly powerless, which in a mouse moving through the human world, you can't right. think of anyone who would be more powerless than that, who ends up changing the whole world of the story yeah. and so i don't i don't know that was that was mine <laughs> yeah. well that's a great answer and i have actually all your answers have been great and i wish we had more time to learn about your writing journey this has just been such a great great interview and everybody you need to read christina's books they're the best out there and whether you read her picture books, her middle grade novels, her graphic memoir, or any of her books, you are sure to walk away with a need to read every single one of Christina's books. You can also check out her website, as she mentioned, SoonTornBot.com. Her YouTube channel has a lot of interesting videos that are related to her books. They also ha have her book trailers. So check that out. And thank you so much for joining me, Christina. E train thank you so much yeah so everybody be sure to follow everything christina's doing when christina writes a new book it just makes the writing world a better place no. and <laughs> i also just want to give a quick shout out that it's extra special because like a special day called giving tuesday is coming up on november 28th and it's all about giving joy and kindness i feel like when you read christina's books 
the when you read them joy and like love a love for reading is instilled in you and so hopefully after this interview you feel inspired to pick up one of Christina's books I'm I know you're going to love them have a great day everybody keep on reading and I'll see you in the next one bye